welcome to Dead Man Talking. Before we start off tonight's show, just a quick reminder, I have a Patreon page up and running now and slowly starting to fill that page. As ever, huge, huge thank you to all of you that have uh, supported, whether through donations or Patreon or merchandise. I'll leave all the necessary links for those in the box below in the description. Um, I am getting the odd question or message or comment asking if I'm leaving YouTube. And for a fact, I am not leaving. Uh, I would never do that to you guys after the long road that we've all taken together. The wonderful journey. Um, it's too much invested. Too much um, great people that are in contact with myself through the channel. And, you know, I'd be silly to walk away from such a great community. Without further ado, as ever, please do like comment and share and don't forget to hashtag team fear with that said let's get into tonight's story from david holly once again exclusive to the dead man talking channel entitled hostile intent crisis in the kia Mitches. let's get straight into that The Kiamichi Mountains are a mountain range in southeastern Oklahoma, a sub-range within the large Owicha Mountains that extend from Oklahoma to western Arkansas. The Kiamichi Mountains are ancient by projecting the existing mountains down to their subsurface roots. Geologists know they once stood as tall as the modern-day Rocky Mountains, which are much younger. Its peaks, which line up south of the Kiamichi River, reach 2,500 feet in elevation. Black Bear Coyote, bobcat, deer, cougar, minks, bats, bald eagles, owls, and roadrunners, and 328 vertebrate species are native to this region. Other reported species have been observed, but their existence has yet to be confirmed. When I was 18 years of age, on a fishing camping trip in southeastern Oklahoma, I was unfortunate enough to encounter a creature which mainstream science said didn't exist. This non-existent creature destroyed a non-invasive camp and slaughtered my parents, grandparents and my father's brother and his family of five. I survived because I climbed a cedar tree and remained quiet and unmoving. I was sure the monster knew I was close for it continued to search the area in and around the campsite. I tell you boys and girls, I had a religious experience that day because I prayed to God. I prayed he would spare me and he did. The monster, and that's exactly what it was, satisfied its bloodlust and casually dragged my 14-year-old cousin, Blake's body, into the woods and, I assumed, fed. I finally gathered my nerve and descended from the tree. My father's Ford F100 pickup truck was the only vehicle which hadn't been damaged. I took the keys out of my father's pocket, climbed into the pickup and took off. We had driven nearly 10 miles off the highway to get to this spot my folks had been told about by others. Who had camped there? It wasn't primitive. It was prehistoric primitive. There had been nowhere to have a bowel movement or urinate or other than in the trees, which were all around our campsite. The roads coming into the area were rough. There was no pavement, not even asphalt road, just gravel and sand. It took me 30 minutes to get to the highway. I stopped at the country store located at the intersection of the highway and the highway to hell I just drove over and borrowed a telephone to call the county sheriff's office to report or report the murder of my entire family at the hands of a giant, hairy monster. Even at 18, I knew the cops were going to think they had some punk Texan teen trying to jerk their chain. So I said a really large black bear had come into our camp and had killed my family. I was told not to leave the store. 30 minutes later, a patrol car from the McCurtain County Sheriff's Office, two fish and wildlife trucks and two state trooper vehicles were at the store. In the distance, I heard the sirens of at least two ambulances, lights flashing, coming towards us. The Reader's Digest version goes on like this. I accompanied everyone to the camp. Two more bodies were now missing, and you could tell all these heavily armed men and one female were nervous. I thought they were going to puke a couple of times, especially after one of the Fish and Wildlife stated the tracks he and his colleague found weren't bear tracks, but looked rather human-like, only a lot larger than the kids. Thank God for size eight and a half feet. 
I was a guest of the county for a few days. And then Uncle Sam intervened. I wasn't a suspect. They just wanted me available for questioning. While walking around town one morning, I enlisted in the United States Marines. I hadn't discussed my plans with any of the cops in Broken Bow. It wouldn't have mattered. I was alone. A local attorney was handling my folks, grandparents and uncle's estates. I needed something to occupy me. I needed training. Discipline. You see, good people, I was willing to enter military service and get the training I need. You see, I knew a monster had killed my family, had made me an orphan. And I was going to return when my enlistment was up and hunt this monster. Do what I had to do and kill it. It was going to be a reckoning and this monster was going to pay for the deaths of my family. I've given you some background about my case. I didn't tell you everything. My name, for instance. Didn't mention whether or not I was single or married. Didn't say anything about whether or not I'd told my story to others or if I had. Was I laughed at or believed? For the record, my name is Shane Nelson. I'm single. I'm happy to say I have a college education. I tried once to talk about what happened to my family and about how it affected me, but yes, the guys I tried talking to simply rolled their eyes and told me I probably saw either a super huge black bear kill my family. So, no, I stopped sharing. I'm six foot two in my socks. I have short cut sandy brown hair. Due to being the sole surviving member of the Nelson family and being legally an adult, I inherited everything. Insurance, existing bank accounts for parents, grandparents, my uncle and his family. My grandparents' farm, 1,100 acres. Everything. I saved most of my money from my four-year enlistment, so yeah, I don't have to work. For what it's worth, I sold everything except a few personal items. Intel is important if you're going to go to war. Buy a home or business, invest money in business ventures, or plan on hunting a creature which, according to experts, doesn't exist. Well, buttercups, I know they exist, but I needed more intel about them. So, after my discharge, I began to haunt my local library for any books written on the subject, watched nearly all of the documentaries, and even attended a few conferences conducted by folks milking the public for what money they could get. Some had decent speakers who rationalised and made sense. Others, well, they simply wanted to debate. I had found myself at a conference in Hanobia, Oklahoma, where a pacifist named Cook had the crowd laughing about the ludicrous story of an 18-year-old man who claimed to have seen his family massacred years ago, as he hid in a cedar tree crying his eyes out like a little baby. Why? He dryly commented. Didn't this witness try to help his family? The story was a lie. These animals were shy and non-aggressive. People who sought to kill them were the true monsters. If I had learned anything from four years of the military, it was to keep quiet, watch and listen and control your emotions. Someone should have told the young woman sitting in the second row to remain quiet. Someone, but not me. She stood up and simply told this guy, Cook, he didn't know what he was talking about. She said she knew the story he'd been just elaborated upon was true. She knew the guy who survived. And it wasn't a bear who killed his family. It wasn't a cougar. It wasn't even Jack the Ripper. It was a type of Bigfoot known by the Choctaw as a Gugwe. The crowd booed her into silence. I made a silent note to talk to her alone if possible. Although she had lied about knowing me or my family. And I did feel some sense of appreciation for what she tried to do. Her name was Valerie Franklin, and she was from a small town in Texas near the Texas-Oklahoma border. To protect her privacy, I've withheld the name of her hometown. She has family living there still. I approached her as she sat outside the conference building, eating a bag of potato chips and sipping a soda. I enjoyed your remarks. She looked up at me, measuring me, trying to determine if I was looking for a hookup with a pretty girl. Uh, thank you, she finally replied. Do I know you? She asked. I know most of the true believers here, but I don't think I know you. That's strange, I said, considering you spoke so wonderfully about knowing me and my entire family. Her delicate hand stopped moving the chip to her mouth. Her beautiful brown eyes grew wide. I'm Shane Nelson. Thank you. I appreciate your attempt in trying to protect my family's good name and my reputation. 
Why'd you do it, miss? Ian Cook is a bastard. He always has something negative to say. No one will ever challenge him, so I lied. I'm sorry. It's okay. Really? I'm interested in what you said about this type of Bigfoot you called a Gugwe? Did I pronounce it correctly? Yes. Can you tell me more about them, miss? Franklin. Valerie Franklin. Can you? Would you tell me more? You're going after it, aren't you? You're going to kill it. I'd rather not say right now. You do understand where there's one. There will be others. How will you know you killed the one who killed your family? Simple. I'll kill all of them. Can you help me? Are you camping here? Or is this a one-day outing? I'm prepared to stay. I have no pressing business anywhere. She pushed her long brown hair away from her face, put a pair of glasses on and began measuring me again. I have room in my tent, and if I tell you anything more about the Gugwe, I want to come along with you when you go after them. It was my time to measure her up. I had known and worked with several women during my time in the service, all good soldiers. Some had made the ultimate sacrifice. I didn't have a problem with working with a female, but did I have the right to accept her terms and put her in harm's way? Well, Nelson, do you accept or do I point you in another direction? I'd hate to see you harmed. This is, after all, my operation. I encountered one when I was ten, another at thirteen. I managed to escape death both times. Please, let me help. Ah, hell. Me trying to convince anyone reading this that I stood firm and said no. I caved in and accepted her, but I had a plan, which I hoped would keep both of us alive. They're called face eaters. They're more aggressive and bigger than your average Bigfoot. They eat their dead and kill anything. The only time your average Bigfoot kills is when you kill one of their own. Although, I'm pretty sure a Bigfoot might sometimes kill just because they're having a bad day or just because, like us, each is wired with their own personality. So, how will you know you're killing the right monster? A white scar across his left cheek runs maybe six to eight inches downward. I'll know him if I see him. Unless a bigger, bolder and more badass Gugwe has already killed him. That'll be hard for me to accept. I watched this creature kill without mercy. We were just having a happy family vacation. They do occasionally mingle with Bigfoot. The Bigfoot apparently don't challenge their presence among them unless they kill one of the Bigfoot. Valerie, I have a plan. How do you like the water? Why do you ask? I have a large barge. We'll launch from the large public state park and travel up the lake until we reach the area where the river feeds into the lake. I don't plan on camping on land. My barge is large enough to set a four-person tent up on the front deck. It's not a houseboat, but it'll work. We'll move slowly up the lake, cool blasting. At least that's what I think it's called. And when we get a response from the shore, I'll drop two anchors, one forward and one after, to keep us in position to get a look at what we call up. You should use Wow Song if you're blasting from the water and they can see the infrared. So I've heard it's said. We'll use ultraviolet. Cats can see it, but primates can't. I'm not trying to be the devil's advocate here, Nelson, but it's going to be cold out on that water. How are we going to stay warm? Gas-powered generator, electric heaters. Ian Cook was a snoopy busybody who came off as a no-nonsense kind of guy who said what was on his mind, and if you didn't agree with his point of view, you were an idiot. I saw him later in the day visiting the folks camping who were safe and snug inside the high-dollar RVs. Valerie didn't own anything except a little tent she was generously sharing with me. I sat beside her campfire sipping on a cold beer when Cook decided to honour our camp with a visit. We all know the Ian Cook type. Smart dresser. Nice clothes, perfect teeth. Yeah, we've all known an Ian Cook at some point in our life. He walked up with a clipboard in his hand, checking a site number and who was camping. He nodded his cocky, no-nonsense head and stood there looking at the name on the clipboard and then looking at me. I asked him finally if there was a problem. He smiled and I had to suppress the urge to stand up and knock his perfect teeth down his sarcastic throat. Yes, I have a Miss Valerie Franklin registered for this spot. Not Miss Franklin and a uh, companion. She'll need to pay us an additional $20 for the others in her party. I paid to camp. Nowhere does it say Miss Franklin and I can't share a campsite now. I'm not sure what scam you think we're buying into. But you're not going to stand here and play campground police. You talk big, mister. 
Nelson. Shane Nelson. Why, I don't believe I've ever met you, Mr. Nelson. Valerie emerged from inside the tent and smiled. In Cook, I'm surprised you don't know Shane. After all, you bathed mouth him this morning before lunch. Why, Valerie, my dear, this is the first time I've ever met this gentleman. When did I ever say anything about him? I'm the kid you made fun of and suggested I didn't see my family killed by some kind of monster. Well, you... Well, you could see the blood drain from this sanctimonious little prick's face. He began to stutter trying to crawfish his way out of either addressing down in public or having his butt kicked by someone he mocked. Now, now, uh, we don't want any unpleasantries here. I I'm sorry, Mr. Shane. Nelson, Nimrod. My last name is Nelson, not Shane. Hell, you're so damn full of self-righteousness you don't even listen when someone introduces you. Valerie stepped between us as I had risen out of my chair and had it in my head to stomp a mud hole in this little prick. Now, other than making a complete jackass out of yourself, what did you stop by for, Ian? We're taking a group out tonight, doing some calls, see if we can get a Bigfoot to respond. Wanted to see if you were interested. <laughs> I don't believe so. I'm sure y'all will have a wonderful time, though. I was still spitting mad, so I didn't say anything else. He mumbled a curt goodbye and hurriedly left our campsite. As the afternoon began its transition to night, we built our fire a little larger. Mid-October, at any elevation, can become rather chilly. We'd eaten our supper and were sitting back drinking a cold beer when others camping around us began to converge on our campsite. A few brought chairs and some blankets. I looked at Valerie, who simply shrugged her shoulders. It seemed good old Ian I spread it around that I was among them who I was camped with, and our neighbours wanted to hear my story for themselves. <sighs> I sighed and told my story again. One young woman with a youngster sitting in her lap asked if I was going to go after the monster, but she asked, how would I know which creature killed my family? I tried once again to explain how I did know, but as I sat there, I knew they couldn't or wouldn't comprehend what I was saying. So finally, I said it. If I have to kill them all, I'll do it and let God sort it out for me. A week later, and Valerie Franklin and I were storing our supplies and equipment on board of my barge when Ian Cook showed up at the dock. He had decided it was his right to join my expedition to ensure no innocent creature or creatures were harmed. Who I asked him had invited him to go with us. His response was typical. No one had invited him. He was coming along to act as an impartial observer. Like he thought I was stupid and didn't realise he was going to be a pain in the butt. Well, I had plans for Mr. Ian Cook. The barge moved slowly through the water. And from the first time I'd ever seen this huge, beautiful lake, I knew it was a deep, cold lake. I was in no particular hurry. We kept the barge towards the middle of the lake, keeping to the deepest channels. Cook must have brought dozens of rolls of 35mm film, for he continued to walk around the barge taking photographs. It was annoying. You know, he said as we slipped into a deep, wide cove. These mountains are really old. Ancient, really. Why, they were once as tall as the Rockies. Do tell, Valerie replied. She wasn't amused by Cook's sudden attempt at camaraderie. I dropped anchors and began helping Valerie set her tent up on the forward deck. It would easily sleep three, maybe even four persons. But Cook had invited himself and had already let him know he could sleep on the bench seat behind the steering wheel and in front of the twin outboards. There was an awning over the back, but I helped put a couple of the tarps up on three sides to impromptu a bed. I started our generator, and we had lights. Cook asked if he might have one of the electric heaters to help him knock the chill off. Did I say chill? Man, it was downright cold on that water. Even though I didn't like the guy, I wasn't a sadist. I gave him one of the heaters. I even supplied him with an extra pillow and thermal blanket. I brought a two-burner Coleman propane cook stove, and Valerie set about making us something to eat. She asked Cook what he'd brought to eat, and he looked dumbfounded. He'd invited himself along, and had brought no food. I told Valerie to give him an MRE, and he could have one of those and a cup of coffee each meal. If he didn't like coffee, well, he could have a bottle of water. That first night on the water, we heard a lot of unusual sounds. Some I could identify, some I couldn't. We were sitting around the heater I was letting Cook use. All of us had our coats on, and Valerie even had warm gloves. 
Far back in the forest north of us, we heard gunshots and an ungodly roar. Cook spun around and almost turned his camp chair over. What was that? he exclaimed. Nelson! Was that the Bigfoot roaring? I admitted to him that I had no idea as to the nature of the creature which had roared back in the woods. Valerie sipped her coffee and looked all around. She asked if we could turn the overhead lights on, the barge, off. I feel vulnerable sitting on the water with lights on. She laughed when she said it, but I knew she was nervous and uncomfortable. Cook, he continued to look around and trying to make small talk. I remained quiet and listened. From the time I'd watched that monster kill my entire family while I clutched the trunk of that cedar tree, I have been a light sleeper. I just didn't sleep that well. Not that I didn't try. It was just impossible for me to not hear everything going on around me. The vocalizations continued. It was after 10.30 and I sent Valerie inside the tent to sleep. Cook had moved the heater near the bench seat, rolled up in his blankets and was sleeping. I'd always been amazed by people who could drop off to sleep so quickly. I brought reading material and was reading about a guy from northeast Texas who had had an encounter on this lake in May of 1971. He and a friend had been fishing and on a camping trip with his father, brother-in-law and elder cousin. The researcher and his buddy were about to graduate from high school. The guy who wrote the report up said he and his buddy, A and C, were stalked and pursued by an 8 foot or 7 foot tall Bigfoot. Their encounter occurred near a primitive camping spot called Holly Creek. This event occurred 40 years or so before my family was killed in an area only a few miles north of this Holly Creek area. The guy's story was fascinating. I promised myself after I killed the monster, which orphaned me, and any of its friends also, I was going to find this guy and buy him a beer. I switched my headlamp off and listened to the water moving against my boat and the wind moving through the trees. Then it dawned upon me that for over an hour and a half I had not heard a single owl hoot, a coyote yelp or any other animal moving about. In the corpse, I had an NCO tell me when you don't hear any normal every day or every night sounds, especially animals, something's just not going to go right. When it happens, listen to your little voice. I eased myself off of my chair, moving slowly. On my stomach, I moved slowly. Our weapons were in a compartment under the front deck. I carefully raised the compartment door enough to reach inside and feel around for one of my pistols. My hand closed around my Colt 1911 45. I eased it out and fed around into the chamber, just as I heard a movement from the shore, walking up to the edge of the north side of the cove. I could hear it breathing, and we were anchored 50 yards away from the shoreline in any direction. The breathing continued, and I heard a loud splash in the water, just short of the barge, and then another splash in the water. A third splash happened, and I knew what was going on. Something big and incredibly strong was throwing large rocks at the barge. A smaller rock finally hit the barge. I stood up, adjusted one of the spotlights mounted on the barge, and lit the north shore line up like a Christmas tree. Standing on the shore was a creature that, except for its colorization and sex, could have been the creature Roger Patterson had filmed in 1967, which all the experts called fake. Only this creature was for real. It bellowed out and Valerie rolled out of her tent looking confused. Cook heard a bellowing, and also jumped up. Oh, this boy was angry. He didn't like the spotlight. I told Cook to begin raising the anchors. Once raised, I told Valerie to start the engines and head towards the middle of the lake. Cook shouted, Kill it! That's what you came for! Kill it! I turned facing him. I couldn't help myself. I sneered at him. It's not the one I'm after. The one I'm after doesn't look like this one. Soon, Valerie had us out of the rock range and shut off the motors. She looked at me and grinned. Cook looked sullenly and wanted to say something, but I'm sure the look on my face said enough. The huge Bigfoot continued throwing rocks, but they all fell short. What now, Captain? Drop anchors in another cove or turn our spotlights on and continue up the lake? Valerie asked. I took a map of the lake out and found our position. I pointed to the Holly Creek area and said that that was where I wanted to be by midday tomorrow. Valerie asked why. You ever hear of a guy from Texas named Dave Holly? Bigfoot Hunter. He and his son have a research group called the Timberline Bigfoot Group. I've never met him. Why? Well, in 1971, he had an encounter with a creature very much like the one we just encountered. My family was killed a few miles north of where he encountered his monster. Ah, I think I understand. Well, boss, let's go. 
Ian, you get your beauty rest. We're headed farther north. Black bear, coyote, bobcat, deer, cougar. 325 vertebrate species are native to this region. Some say other more exotic creatures call this region home also. There was little sleep that first night. Rocks would be thrown. Howling and bellowing broke the silence whenever it seemed we'd get some genuine rest. Cook surprised me by keeping quiet, though, through it all. I heard Valerie ask him once if he regretted tagging along with the two of us. He said he wasn't unhappy, and he certainly wasn't disappointed. Toward dawn, everything settled down. Cook was sleeping, and Valerie had climbed back inside the tent. I alone watched the sun rise in the east, waving the tops of the mountains surrounding the lake in a beautiful, bright sunlight. A light fog hung over the lake. I raised the anchors and slowly eased the barge up lake. There was no hurry, but I wanted to get to Holly Creek. For some reason, I knew if I was going to find a good way, this was the area. Two hours into our slow cruise, Valerie emerged from the tent and began making strong black coffee. She woke up Cook and gave him a cup, told him she was going to scramble some eggs and fry some bacon. She asked him if he was hungry. It didn't surprise me when he said yes, he was hungry, but he was willing to eat another MRE if there wasn't enough to go round. Valerie assured him that after the episode we'd all shared a few hours earlier, he was welcome to eat fresh food. I followed the map closely. By noon, we could see it had to be Holly Creek Landon. A few campers were set up along a flat area, lying below a road running throughout the park. I decided we'd land, continue to sleep on the barge, but perhaps walk along the shore to stretch our legs. I gave specific instructions to Ian to keep quiet about what we were doing. No need to frighten folks who were unaware of what exotic animals might be prowling in a forest. I turned in towards the gravel beach and turned off the two outwards. Ian leapt off the barge as it was nudging the shore and tied the barge to a healthy looking oak tree. An attractive brunette with long black hair and wearing a camo cap walked up and gave him a hand. The woman wasn't alone as two men joined her in helping secure the heavy barge. Valerie jumped off and walked over to the campers and began a conversation. I joined her, introducing myself. Thanks for your help. The barge can be hard to hold sometimes. I'm Shane Nelson. My friends Valerie Franklin and Ian Cook. The older man extended his hand and shook hands. James Fuller. My wife Rhonda and my good friend Rick Murphy. Valerie grinned and Cook developed a nervous cough. The woman Rhonda looked at him and said, You should do something about that cough. Then she slapped him on the back and grinned. Rick, she smiled sweetly. Be a dear and go to the van and get that cough medicine I brought along. The man she called Rick saluted her and walked towards a red Ford cargo van parked close by. Valerie and Rhonda got together and began talking like they'd known each other over the years. But hell, maybe they had. Maybe they knew the Fullers and the Murphy guy. Murphy returned and Rhonda took the bottle from him. I could see it was a bottle of Southern Comfort. Ian took a small drink and glared at the three. Where'd y'all come from, Fuller? We've been here since you made an ass out of yourself at Honobia. I, he glanced at his wife. Heard you ran into Shane here after you said the story about him watching his family being killed by a Bigfoot was not true. Uh, I, I might have said some things which were taken out of context. Taken out of context, my butt, said Murphy. I was sitting there in the audience with my wife, Sandy. I heard this young lady challenge you. Valerie tilted her head a bit and said, I don't remember seeing you. I was sitting two rows behind you, and I saw him. He motioned towards me, and although he's older now, I remembered his picture being a lot in the local papers, even on the cover of those papers they sell in supermarkets. Stood far back in the crowd that night when a lot of folks found out who you were. I listened to your story, returned home the next morning with Sandy, called the Major and Rhonda, and here we are. I moved over to the picnic table and sat down. Fuller walked over and sat down beside me. His wife and Valerie walked off towards their camp. Rick Murphy sat down on the other side of me. James Fuller pushed his hat back. A few years ago, Rick and I were on an expedition right here in this very campground. The second night here, we began hearing some really angry roars coming from the deeper forests. Then the roars became more aggressive sounding. Everyone in the group we were with was armed, nervous and armed. That's not a good combination, I said. No, it's not. And then the roar stopped, and we heard screaming. We were under attack. We thought we were dealing with your everyday Bigfoot, 
But we were wrong. The Choctaw call them face eaters. You know them now as Gugwe. I got knocked down and was out for the fight. Rick here covered me shooting non-stop with his weapons and mine. He stayed with me through it all. I believe you jarheads call it Semper Fe? He smiled. How'd you know I was? A jarhead? Takes one to know one, son. Rick and I have dealt with these creatures several times. Rhonda was with us the last time. He paused. I believe he was thinking about his encounters. We'd like to help you out, son. Shane, if you'll have us, that is. Ian had walked away when Fuller had begun talking. Now he returned full of fire and vinegar. Did the great Bigfoot adventurer tell you and his friends we were suspected of killing everyone on that little outing? Huh? Did he? Did he tell you for almost a year the two of them were persons of interest, even though when the authorities arrived, there were no bodies? No one believed their story. They found redemption after two years ago, when there was another attack on another expedition, and he and Ricky Boy here managed to alert the camp, but not before they lost a member. No one is certain of a pack of wolves or a couple of huge black bears didn't account for that disaster. A cool voice said, Mister, you talk too much. There was no warning. Rhonda Fuller spun Ian Cook around and slapped his face so hard he dropped to the cold October ground. She bent over him and produced a three fifty seven Magnum Smith & Wesson and placed it under Cook's chin. No one's out here except us, Ian. You've been a thorn in every legitimate researcher's side since you were 30. You know, I could kill you right here. And the general consensus is, I should. She holstered a weapon and stood up. The next time I overhear you trying to cast aspersions on my husband's honour and ethics, I'll blow you away. You understand? That goes for Mr Nelson's encounter and what happened when Rick was trying to guide that other piece of crap, Mark Knight's expedition, last winter. Do you understand me? Cook weakly said he understood, and Rhonda stood back up and looked at her husband. Fuller said nothing, and told me we should camp with them, and we'd work out a plan for the night. Others say more exotic animals have been reported in this region. Murphy had set a four-man tent up next to the Fuller's van. Valerie, Ian and I would share the tent with Murphy. Ian, of course, wasn't happy with the accommodations. I didn't care. Valerie filled me in more fully while we went for a walk later in the afternoon. These people had fought the Gugwe and had survived. I'd be a fool not to have them with me. Ian was going to be a major problem. I made a decision to ask Fuller to have Murphy drive him to Hernobia, or whatever his home was. We could remain here and wait on Murphy, or meet him farther up the lake. There are no more landings up the lake, Shane, she protested. Well, there's one. Probably not very popular spots, and I'm sure no one's camped there. The area where your family died? Yeah. Oh, I knew it didn't sit well with her. But she should have known this was where I had been heading all along. Locals refer to it as Lost Souls Cove. No one camped there. The road hadn't changed that much. Over beers that night, I laid my plan out for Jim and Rhonda Fuller. Privately, we explained everything to Rick, who was agreeable. Ian Cook was going home. High on an ancient feeding ground, three immense creatures tore into the remains of a couple of wild hogs. They were cruel-looking creatures with reddish eyes. A fourth creature emerged from the timber and growled. It was much larger than the other three and older. It stood twelve feet tall and weighed better than three quarters of a ton. The three feeding creatures growled angrily but gave way to the newcomer, for this was the dominant male. He was an ugly brute, and his features made him appear to have a short, thick snout, much like a bear. The long white scar that ran the length of his left cheek was a badge of honour for him. He had received it when he surprised and fought an older Bigfoot years ago. The Bigfoot had been huge itself, but it was old and weakened from years of rivalry between the Bigfoot and the Gugwe. Now... The Gugwe, the original Bigfoot species, was making a comeback. The Bigfoot avoided them, if possible. Even the dog-like creatures that walked as the Gugwe and the Bigfoot gave way when they came into their territory. When they sought the flesh of the hairless ones, they simply sought the hairless ones. Ignorant of territory claims, they'd be attacked, killed and devoured. Scar, as Shane Nelson would later refer to him, knew where the hairless ones were. Four mouths and two shes. But... The great beast was one troubled, for he remembered the scent of one of the mouths. The scent mingled with cedar. But the great beast could not remember where or when the small defenseless creature had escaped him. 
He growled and looked around for any to challenge taking his food and began to eat. The next morning, Rhonda Fuller explained to Ian that he was leaving. Simple. Ian obviously remembered her promise. Now, she reminded him again, and then told him how wise and smart he would be not to report her overreaction of the day before, as they were five witnesses who would provide an alibi should she be visited by the authorities. Ian got the message. While Murphy took Ian wherever he called home, the Fullers joined Valerie and myself on the barge. I had told him the night before about this guy Holly from northeast Texas, who had had an encounter on the island across from Holly. Not to be confused with the researcher, Creek. Fuller nodded his head and pointed out to the island. I wonder if his flag is still at the top, Fuller commented. I didn't know about any flag, so Fuller told me the rest of the story. It boggled the mind. These two guys, which had eluded a ticked-off Bigfoot, had been the same age as myself when my, when my family had been killed. We passed the island and I blew an air horn out of respect. I told Jim Fuller when this was over, I was going to find this guy and drink a beer with him. From time to time, we simply eased into a cove and sat. I admit, I was getting nervous. It had been years since I'd been back. Valerie knew there were three wooden crosses and three reefs of flowers in the barge's storage compartment. When we got to the spot, I had my very intention of honouring my family. I also hoped... No, that's not right. I prayed for an opportunity to kill the creature that made me an orphan. I knew when the barge rounded a bend in the lake and on the western shoreline... I saw the cedar tree I had hidden in. In my mind's eye, I began to relive everything that happened to that horrible day. Dear God, I clearly remembered my mother screaming as she saw my uncle gutted like a fish by some giant, hair-covered abomination. I saw the creature break my mother's neck with a backhand. My father and grandfather ha having their heads crushed. I remembered climbing as high and as rapidly into the cedar, hoping I could blow out the screams and the roars, the pleas for the bastard to just go away. I suppose... They were all watching me slowly lose my composure, for I began to cry. I collapsed into the seat and turned the key off, killing the motors, and we just drifted. I felt small, soft hands squeezed my own hands, and felt the hug of Valerie Franklin as she tried to comfort me. I raised my head and saw Rhonda Fuller and Jim Fuller looking at me, not out of pity, not out of disgust, but looking at me with compassion, understanding, Rhonda stepped up in front of me, and she knelt down and took my hands in hers. We're sorry for the loss of your family, Shane. Truly. We'll drop anchors here. We'll be cool blasting. Beat wood together, if you want. Or just simply wait. Shane. Jim Fuller spoke up. I'm guessing. Now I'm listening to a little voice in my head that's telling me the creature that killed your entire family is still alive. Somewhere in this forest in front of us. It's watching us right now. Salivating. Believing it's going to have a feast. But we're not going to be a takeout meal for him or any other. What are you carrying? Uh, a Remington 30 6 an old school Enfield British 30, a couple of 12 gauge shotguns, my 1911 Colt 45, and a 45 cow high point for Valerie. The attack came when? Look, I know you don't want to relive this, Marine, but this murdering, demonic beast is going to be a creature of habit. I really believe it's watching us right now. If not him, then one of his troop he's part of. Shortly after 1pm. Yeah, I'm sure. Early afternoon. Jim, we're going to need a bait. Rhonda, I found out simply, put it out there. We knew Rick would be coming in, but we didn't know when. Rhonda walked over to the control panel on the barge and picked up my CB radio. She flipped it over to channel 3 and began sending out a call. Jim Fuller was on his cell phone calling Rick's phone and surprisingly was answered. Rick had dropped Ian off in Smithville and was now on the highway to and from hell. Estimated time of arrival was 10 minutes. We put ashore five minutes later. Valerie was nervous as I was. I'd never had any time for romance as my entire reason for living was to destroy that which had destroyed all I loved and adored. But over this short time I was infatuated with this attractive woman who wore glasses, drank beer and seemed two steps ahead of me. I wasn't in love but I wanted to be if... We survived. I was daydreaming, and she was saying something. Uh, I'm sorry, Val. I got lost in my thoughts. What were you saying? I was saying I like you, Shane. I've been married. It didn't work out. I don't know how you feel about me, but 
if we get out of this alive and in one piece, I'd like it if you would consider letting me be your girl. I smiled and kissed her, and then we heard the roar. Rick was running later than he thought, so I had Valerie bring the barge closer to the shore, and I jumped off the barge with a 30 or 6 What I hadn't told Fuller is my Oort 6 was loaded with armor-piercing rounds. I just needed a target. I heard Valerie scream and both Fuller and Valerie shouting to shoot. The Gugway emerged from my left, just about where he killed my grandmother. And yeah, he had a scar on his left cheek, and age had not diminished his speed. He was more than twice my size. It was truly a David and Goliath face-off. Valerie fired her pistol into the water to give me an opportunity to bring the rifle up. I heard another scream coming from behind me, and the crack of a 308 Jim Fuller was carrying. Ronda's 357 mag was barking also. I got my first shot off and saw Scar stumble backwards. He recovered his balance and started for me again. I fired another round with the same results. All the time, he was advancing. I was retreating, but not towards the boat. But whether consciously or subconsciously, I was backing myself up against the tree. And a monster straight out of Dante's Inferno was still advancing. Slower now, but still advancing, baring his teeth, opening and closing his clawed hands. Two more rounds left in my rifle. Just two. Then I hoped the Colt would help me. I fired twice in rapid succession towards its massive, horrible mouth. Both rounds hit true. It made one last grab as it clawed towards me. I heard a voice call my name and Rick Murphy tossed me his shotgun yelling to finish it. Where the hell had he come from? I fired point blank range into its gaping jaws. It shuddered and stopped moving. I looked around. The two Gugway who had joined in an attack lay dead in the clearing. I turned my head to see what tree I'd backed up against. You're correct. It was the cedar. I pulled my red Dodge Ram into the broken driveway and got out of the pickup. I told Valerie to get out with me. I knocked on the front door and a guy with dark brown hair with a lot of grey opened the door. He always made it known he was 66, but he didn't look it. Hi, can I help y'all? My name won't mean much to you. You've probably never heard of me, but I'm Shane Nelson. Would you be Dave Holly? The guy grinned. I was this morning. What can I do for you, Mr. Nelson? Dave, may I call you Dave? This... I put my arm around Valerie's waist. It is my wife. And we'd like to buy you a beer and tell you an amazing story. <laughs>